Okay, welcome to Phototech again. I think this is day 14 if I remember right. And um, today we have uh, Dr. Hani Farid from Dartmouth Computer Science Department to talk to us about a new approach to digital image forensics. Hani, take it away. Thanks. I'm amazed there's this many people here this early. Jeez, I'm on sabbatical, so like nine o'clock seems really early to me now. Um, so uh, at Dartmouth, we've been thinking for the last uh, seven years or so about how you detect tampering in images. And one way you might think about this is the way most people have thought about it in the past, which is watermarking. So you have a trusted camera, you insert a watermark, you extract a signature, and you look for deviations of that as evidence of tampering. And that's you know, a reasonable thing to do to the extent that you believe watermarking actually will work. Um, but I can tell you, having done this for a few years now, uh, the vast majority of images, you don't have that luxury. Um, things are appearing in a court of law or in the media, on the web, and you don't have this luxury of saying, you know, was this thing, do I have a trusted sensor? And so we've been thinking about how do you do forensics in the absence of watermarking and of signatures. And so what I'd like to do today is just give you a little bit of idea of the scope of the issues around digital tampering, like where is it actually impacting us as a society. Uh, I'll give you a brief overview of sort of how we've been thinking about this problem and just very quickly highlight a number of techniques. And then near the end of the talk, we'll dive into some details and actually do some, some real technical um, um, work. OK, so where is digital tampering affecting us? Well, the obvious place. <laughs> I know, I, I love the slide because there's always like about a three second pause and then people see it. <laughs> um, is it possible to bring the lights down in the front just a little bit just to get a slightly higher contrast? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so it's clear that digital tampering is affecting us in the media. Um, just in this last week, the New York Times published a doctorate photograph. A uh, newspaper in Ohio published you know, close to 100 doctorate photographs this year alone that they discovered. And you know, pretty much it's every week this is happening. This is actually an image that USA Today published. Um, just like this, this is actually what they published. This is the photograph that the photographer actually took. And this is a true story. When this image showed up, the White House wrote to the USA Today, or called maybe, and complained that, they, that the USA Today made Condoleezza Rice look demonic. This is, this is the word that they used. They were very upset. And USA Today very quickly uh, retracted and issued an apology. But you know, this is a very simple type of manipulation. Ph ph photographers are doing this all the time, right? This is not shocking. I love this example, because th look, think about how few pixels were actually changed, and what a dramatic impact it had on the image. Um, People probably saw this one. This was a photograph published by Reuters um, late last year. Um, this is the image that was published. Um, it showed the remnants of an Israeli bombing in a Lebanese town. This was the photograph that was actually taken by the photographer. Um, and you can see here, oops, oh, red button, OK. You can see here these little curly cues repeated over and over again. So he did a cloning job. He just added more smoke. People accused him. Unfortunately, he was a Lebanese photographer, so there was sort of the whole you know, Lebanese-Israeli thing. They accused him of trying to exaggerate the damage of the bombing. I, I don't actually buy it. I think he just thought this looked weird and just thought it would look better with a little bit of smoke. Nevertheless, um, on this day, Reuters, I mean, people are still talking about this photograph. Uh, and Reuters is still reeling from the scandal of publishing a doctorate photograph. Um, and. Um, I can tell you, I was recently visited the Associated Press. They're also completely freaked out by this. Both these organizations deal with on the order of 10,000 photographs a day. So you can think about the scope of the issues. And 75% of the photographers are freelance. They're just, you know, don't, don't know who they are. They're just, you know, people sending photographs. So both the Reuters and AP are clearly dealing with this issue in a very serious way. Um, this is a cover of Newsweek that appeared uh, when Martha Stewart was coming out of prison. Um, the, so the headline reads, after prison, she's thinner, wealthier, and ready for prime time. So the editors at Newsweek thought, or hypothesized, that when Martha Stewart was going to come out of prison, she'd be thin because the prison food is bad. And so they wanted a picture of a thin Martha Stewart, but she's in jail, so they don't have a picture of her. So what did they do? Well, they took her head. And they took a model's body, and they put the two on the cover, and they, they published it. So this is, this is not Martha Stewart. It's, I mean, it's her head, but it's somebody else's body. And this is the cover of Newsweek. And this is not like Star Magazine, right? I mean, this is amazing. And so when, when people complained, Newsweek said, look, what's the problem? Um, and they said, go to page like four. And in three-point font, in the bottom right-hand corner, it says, um, headshot 
by, and they give the photographer's name. And that's their disclosure that this is not actually a photograph of Martha Stewart, but it's in fact just her head and somebody else's body who we don't know. And by the way, uh, Time Magazine just published a cover with uh, Ronald Reagan on it with a fake tear. News and Time Week have been doing this forever. And they finally just came out and said, look, our covers are strictly conceptual. Get over it, right? They're not photographs anymore. They're conceptual, which I love. They finally admitted it, and we, we can move on. Um, so the media is clearly, on a weekly, daily basis, struggling with this. I mean, the vast majority of images you are seeing on a daily basis in the media are being manipulated in some ways, from the profound to the trivial. No doubt about it. Uh, it's happening at our own back door. Uh, this is a picture of Professor Huang Wu Suk, who was being touted as a possible Nobel laureate because of his groundbreaking work in stem cell research. Um, he published several very groundbreaking papers um, in science. And slowly, uh, the results started to unravel. And it turned out so he was doing cloning. And it turned out that the cloning he was doing that was not in the lab, but it was in Photoshop. What he was doing is he was cloning images of cells to make it look like he had actually cloned cells. But it was a Photoshop cloning, which was a bit of a problem, it turned out. And, um, <laughs> The, the papers got retracted, and he resigned, and it was a disaster. And I can tell you, it is not just him. Um, I was recently talking with Mike Rosner, who's the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Cell Biology, and he says that 20% of manuscripts that he publishes, figures have to be remade because of inappropriate manipulations in the images. That's 20%. And he said 1% are downright fraudulent. They're just they're fake, completely fake. So take that, that's one journal, and now multiply that by you know, what we're publishing, and you've got a major problem out there. And I've talked with Science and Nature and PNAS and folks at the Office of Research Integrity. And it is, there are, there is another major scandal that will happen in the next few years. And slowly, the scientific publishing community has to start getting a grips on this, on this problem. <laughs> OK, so it's happening in uh, media. It's happening in science. It's happening in politics. I love this last election. It was so much fun. Um, so this was Ned Lamont of Connecticut. He was running against Joseph Lieberman. And uh, one of Lieberman's um, uh, uh, I guess people who wanted him in office published this image on the website. This is actually published on a website. Okay, so fine. This is probably not a true image, and I don't think very many people are fooled by it. But it was a fascinating example of tampering because what you see more and more in political campaigns are the creation of digital images linking people in a both negative and a positive light. And even though, even if people know that the image is fake, um, these images stay with you. In fact, there's really interesting work in the psychology literature that says even if you show images to people and you tell them that they're fake, you can actually start to implant those memories in them. They, they start to forget that they're fake images. They're like, they're like false memories. So, e, e, okay, so nobody's going to be confused by this. But nevertheless, um, this image, uh, which had appeared when John Kerry was running for uh, the, the primary actually appeared. So it showed Carrie and Fonda sharing a stage in an anti-war rally. And it had like a whole headline, the caption, and the whole bit. It was a really good forgery. Made the rounds. Front, front page, everybody was talking about this when it came out. And then later it came out that it was actually a for forgery. It was a composite of these two images. Um, they, were, they never were at the anti-war rally. And I heard this on NPR just before the election. Uh, there was an undecided voter, and the, the interviewer was asking them, um, who are you going to vote for? He said, well, I can't vote for Kerry. In the interview, he said, well, why not? He said, well, I can't get that image of Kerry and Fonda out at an anti-war rally out of my head. And the interviewer said, well, you know, it's a fake image. He said, like, I know, but I can't get the image out of my head. And I mean, that was fascinating, right? I mean, he knew it was fake, but it still bugged him. It really, really troubled him, even though it was a fake image. Um, and you are seeing more and more political campaigns are doing this type of, of, of games. It's happening all the time now, which I think is a very interesting um, turn. OK, so now it's in the media, it's in the science, it's in politics. It is certainly in the law uh, in a very profound way. And let me just give you one example of that. In 1996, Congress passed what's called the Child Pornography Prevention Act. And what they said in part was they were trying to update the current laws for child pornography. And they wrote that we are going to ban a range of sexually explicit images, sometimes called virtual porn, that appear to depict minors but were produced by means other than using real children, such as the use uh, th such as using youthful adults or computer imaging technology. So forget about youthful adults. That, we don't care about that. It's this part we care about. So what they said is that computer-generated images, Shrek, The Incredibles, that kind of stuff, is illegal. Even though no child was involved in the creation, no actual child is depicted, we're going to make that image illegal, in addition to child pornography. Interesting idea, by the way. I, I'm sort of on the fence of whether this is a good idea or not. 
uh, the Free Speech Coalition sued. By the way, I love this. The Free Speech Coalition. Anybody know what that is? It's the porn industry. <laughs> it's like this big conglomerate of all this porn industry. And they, they created this thing called the Free Speech Coalition, which I love. I love that. I think Larry Flint is in there somewhere, I'm sure, or was. Um, so they sued. And the US Supreme Court heard the case in 02. And Ashcroft at the time argued the following. Well, Justice argued. The reason we are making computer graphics images illegal is that we believe that if somebody looks at that image, they are going to commit a subsequent criminal act, i.e. sexual abuse. And the Supreme Court said, virtual child porn is not intrinsically related to the abuse of children. The government asserts that images can lead to actual instances. The Supreme Court said, no, we're not buying it. And they struck down the CPPA. So now we are in a state of affairs where virtual child porn is protected by the First Amendment. Really interesting. Well, how does that affect anybody? Well. People are now, this happens routinely, uh, are, being are, are being caught with child pornography. They are being arrested. And then they say, they're not real. They're virtual. So what happens? Well, the burden of proof now shifts. The prosecution has to prove that the images are real. And how do you do that? And the courts have actually also ruled, in fact, there was a federal ruling just four months ago that said, not only do you have to prove that they're real, but we don't actually believe, because CG technology is so good, that people can actually look at the image and tell, tell them apart. So if you don't have a mechanism by which you can prove that that image is actually a real photograph, you can't show it to the jury because it's prejudicial. And now you got a mess. Right? How do, you, how, do you, how do you prosecute these crimes? So, and this is just one corner of the place where digital imaging is affecting the law. I mean, virtually every crime now has some kind of digital technology around it. Um, civil cases, criminal cases, malpractice cases. I do a lot of expert witness testimony these days and constantly in a courtroom talking about photographs, video, images as evidence. And people, it is on their mind that you can manipulate digital media. And if that's on your mind, you can raise the specter of doubt about authenticity. And it's, it is just pervasive in the law. Um, OK. So it's really, it's sort of everywhere. And I think we also live in a really fascinating time where photography is something very different than it has been in the past, um, than it was 10 years ago. And we live in an age where really, you know, we don't really believe the images we see anymore. We know that Photoshop can do things that they never used to be able to do. And there is this doubt about authenticity of digital media. So as I said in the beginning of the talk, we've been developing um, techniques to detect tampering. So let me now just sort of give you a one slide overview of a number of different techniques we've developed. And then we'll dive into some details of some cool things. Well, I think they're cool at least. OK, so some of the techniques we've developed are unbelievably simple and boneheaded. So here's a really simple idea. Uh, image number one, taken by Canon PSA510. Image number two, taken by an Olympus C2020Z. So almost every digital camera, sadly, saves in JPEG format. I'm trying to tell people not to do that, but they do. And so when you save an image in JPEG format, you have some options, which is how do you compress the images? In fact, you have a lot of options. So the way manufacturers decide on the actual compression is with what's called the JPEG quantization table. So the JPEG quantization table is eight by eight numbers, and there's actually three of these. Okay? And you trade them off. The smaller the number, the higher the quality of the images, but also the lower the compression. The higher the numbers, the more compression, but the more artifacts you get. And you've got 64 by 3 degrees of freedom. And every manufacturer does something a little bit different. Well, not everyone. They add, there's, you know, there's some reasonable bounds. So typically, these numbers up in the corner here, which correspond to the low frequencies, are a little bit smaller than these numbers. But it turns out we've been looking at close to 500 cameras now that these are somewhat unique. Um, to each camera. There's equivalence classes, and often there's several cameras in one. But here's a really simple idea. Just grab the, the quantization table and compare it to what you think the camera came out of. But here's the really cool part. Photoshop, since version 0 0.1, has not changed their JPEG quantization table. It is exactly the same. And CS3 uses the same one. They have not changed it in the last, is that you, Debbie? <laughs> She's one of my former students. <laughs> and I remember you doing that in class, too. <laughs> oh, she's blushing. <laughs> OK, so, so a really simple forensics tool is if somebody claims, and we actually did this in a case, uh, actually it was a police department, claimed that the images came directly out of the camera, grabbed the quantization table, and it was a Photoshop quantization table. I'm like, well, you got a problem, guys, because there's no way this came out of the camera. Um, so really simple idea. Don't know what they did, of course, in Photoshop, but just really simple way to 
um, do a, a sort of a first pass forensics. OK. What is the most common type of manipulations you see in tampering? And probably the most common one is this cloning, right? You've got something in the image, and you want to get rid of it, right? So for example, I want to get rid of that uh, little driftwood there. And so what do you do? Well, you grab a bunch of sand from somewhere else, and you copy it, OK? And you leave the red and the yellow blocks off. So this is actually the output of the algorithm. So we have, we've developed a technique that actually looks for this type of cloning. And so the idea is really simple, right? If you grab one chunk of image and you copy and paste it, you've got these virtually identical regions in the image. And what's hard about this is, is a computational problem. You don't know where in the image or how big they are. And so the trick of this algorithm is how do you make this efficient when you've got a 12 megapixel image? And that's where a lot of the algorithmic issues came up. But a uh, very nice, simple technique for detecting tampering. Uh, here's another one, very common form of manipulation. Uh, this is the original image. This is the doctored. Uh, you take this person, you isolate them, you rescale them to make them larger. So what happens when you rescale? Well, you have to create pixels. You have to interpolate. So if I resize, if I rotate, there's a number of pixels on the off integer lattice that have to be interpolated by Photoshop. And that means that there's a subset of pixels in here that are very specifically correlated to their neighbors because of this interpolation artifacts. And we can detect that, and we can detect if something has been resized, resampled, skewed, or whatever. Here's another one that I really like. Uh, it's based on color filter array. So you know probably that uh, cameras don't actually capture, well, except for the Foveon camera, um, does not capture full-blown RGB. It, cap it has a single sensor, and it captures a subset of the pixels you need, and then it does a demosaicing or interpolation. So in any color image, a subset of the pixels in the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel have been interpolated from the original Bayer pattern or color filter array. And that means when you introduce something into an image such as this that does not have those patterns, you can actually detect deviations of the color filter array interpolation. OK, uh, this is a, a really cool one. Um, it actually exploits the fact that um, the optics on cameras are imperfect. We know that there's all kinds of um, optical aberrations in an image. Uh, the type of thing you will often see is this um, chromatic aberration, which is a slight splitting of the red and green blue channels relative to each other because of Snell's law. And so you get this sort of color aberration. And so then the idea is that you can actually model these aberrations. It turns out you can model them very nicely with a low order um, model. And you can look for consistencies or inconsistencies. It turns out we can start doing ballistics with this, too, because each um, camera does something slightly different in their lens train to minimize ab aberrations. And so they manifest themselves very differently. OK, so lighting and shadow. This is my favorite forgery. Um, so this is, of course, Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie when they were still rumored to have a relationship. And everybody was desperate to get an image. They offered half a million dollars for an image of them together. Can you believe that? That's amazing. Um, so this image is really interesting. So let's take a look at it. So here they are outside on a beach, presumably walking together. And let's look at Angelina Jolie. So she's got a shadow here on her feet. She's got a drop shadow on her chin. And her face is equally illuminated. And you see a slight lighting gradient on her leg. So all evidence suggests that the sun is somewhere in this direction over here, right? OK. So let's think about that for a second. So sun is here. Now let's look at Brad Pitt's face. All right, we got a problem, right? Because for Brad Pitt, the sun is, what, over here? <laughs> I mean, this is like 210 degrees off, right? I mean, this is amazing. But the best part about this is you don't notice. Like, when you just put it up like that, your brain doesn't really care, right? It doesn't seem to really care. It doesn't bother you. Does it bother you? Really? I, when I saw this, it was not at all obvious to me. I, I, I just didn't. And by the way, there, there's, there's psychological, maybe you have a better brain than I do. There's evidence in the psychology literature that, in fact, the human brain is largely insensitive to these types of manipulations. It doesn't care about inconsistent shadows, inconsistent lighting. It seems to basically ignore them. Um, they, I think they painted a shadow. I actually think they, they drew it in because they knew it was wrong. So there's a class of, of questions on intelligence tests about that do this. Yes, I saw that. And I'm really bad at it, I think. <laughs> um, I have seen that. Like, if the light is here, where would the shadow be, right? 
Yeah. There's actually a competition on the web right now. You can win a house in London by figuring out where a shadow from a telephone pole is. So some people are having trouble selling their house. So what they did is they took a picture of the house. There's a telephone pole in the front and the shadow cast by the telephone pole. And they removed the shadow and they said, guess where the shadow is and you win the house. And it costs like 60 bucks to get in or 100 bucks, actually 60 pounds. And they're limiting it to 25,000 people. They're going to raise something like $3.6 million. This is brilliant. I love this idea. And if you can figure out where the shadow is, maybe you should go. You, you'll probably be good at it. <laughs> it's six, yeah, you know, summer house in the UK, not bad. Um, so we've been developed. So here it is obvious, right? And especially after I pointed out, it's obvious. Um, but often it's actually much more subtle than this. And we've actually been developing techniques that can estimate where the illuminating light source in the world is relative. And th this is one of the techniques that I'll talk about in a little bit of detail. Uh, this is actually a, a, a photograph of these uh, TV hosts uh, from American Idol. It was actually given to this image was given to me by the AP. And um, I, 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 I spent a lot of time talking with the folks at the AP because you know, they got 10,000 images coming in a day. And um, often what happens is there's a few images they're a little worried about. So they send me images, and we get to play with them in a forensic setting. And they were a little worried about this one. Does this one bug in you too? Yeah, doesn't it? This one actually is not very good. Fox News actually made this. <laughs> and they gave it to the AP. What a surprise. <laughs> so um, yeah, when we saw it, it was bugging us too. It's something, something's clearly wrong. But here's a really cool thing. Uh, so this is actually a blow up of their eyes, this guy, this guy, and her. And look at the little white specularities, which of course are a reflection of the light source that's in the world. So these two have classic studio lighting, two diffuse light sources like this. And now you see something very different here and here. So the eyes are completely fantastic, right? Because they reflect the world that that person was looking at when they were photographed. And in high resolution images, not only can you actually estimate where the light was from that specularity, and I'll talk a little bit about that, you can actually, with a high enough resolution image, you can actually recover an image of what they were looking at. Um, and that's very cool, actually. Um, I won't talk about that, however. Um, OK. So, OK, so you got a sort of a flavor for the types of stuff we do. We, go, we do everything from sort of pixel, statistical type of stuff to more geometric lighting and optical. And there's sort of a whole bunch of techniques. And the general philosophy is none of these techniques is perfect. They all have countermeasures. They will only be applicable in certain times. But the idea is that as you begin to create a web of these techniques, each one makes it harder and harder and harder to create a forgery because you've got to sort of make sure you don't disturb any of these things. And there's more. I'm not actually giving all of them. Um, and we continue to develop new ones. So let, let's talk about the lighting stuff, because I think that one's really cool. All right. So we need to start by making some simplifying assumptions. And we're going to try to relax them in a minute. So here's what I'm going to start off by assuming. I'm going to start off by assuming that my scene is illuminated by a single light source, that it is infinitely far away, and that it's a point light source. So think the sun, basically. Okay? And I'm going to assume that my surface that's being illuminated is Lambertian and has constant reflectance. So by Lambertian, I mean that the amount of light that's reflected in all directions is the same. So it's not like something shiny. And by constant reflectance, I mean it has the same color everywhere. Okay? So very, very stringent constraints right? on both the surface and on the light source. We're, we're going to relax a lot of it, but let's just start there. Okay? And by the way, classic assumptions in graphics and vision. And nothing's shocking here. So with those assumptions, I can write the intensity, which is i, at, at a point on my object right there, as the following. It is a product of the reflectance function, its color, a dot product between the surface normal and the light direction, and an ambient term. So let's do this one first. So at this point, think about a sphere. You've got a surface normal, which is perpendicular to the, to the sphere. You've got a, a vector that points towards the, the, the light source. And I'm going to take an inner product between those. And remember that the inner product is proportional to the cosine of the angle between them. So all this is saying is that if the surface is facing the light source, it will be very bright, and it will fall off as a cosine as you go away from that. That's it. Okay? And you see that here. Bright here towards the light falls off. And of course, the ambient is just for all the sort of reflected light that comes back and hits anyway. OK. So in general, what we will have here is red is, is, is things that we're going to be, we want to measure that are going to be knowns. Blue are things that we want to be able to estimate that are unknowns. OK. So this vector is a three vector, of course, because we're in three space. This vector is a three vector, the direction to the light source. So this thing's annoying. R. Like, how the hell am I ever going to figure that out? Ooh, this is being published. <laughs> I will try not to swear. <laughs> um, you know, the video where I just made fun of you is going to be on the web, so <laughs> you may want to turn the phone off. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Debbie. <laughs> 
So this R is annoying, because I'm never going to be able to estimate this. So, but it turns out we can get rid of it, and here's how. Um, I don't actually care about the magnitude of this vector. What I care about is the direction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that I'm going to write a proportionality instead of an equi equivalence, and say I'm only going to estimate this up to an unknown scale factor. Okay? And then the reflectance term goes away. All right, now, here's the good news. It's linear. If we, it's linear in the unknowns, right? These are just a bunch of values we know. We don't know these. We don't know this. It's linear. This is great. That's the good news. The bad news is that I have to come up with 3D surface normals from a single image. Really bad news, because I'm not going to be able to do that unless the world is peppered with Lambertian constant reflectance spheres everywhere, which I would love, because it would make my job a lot easier. But OK, it's not going to happen. OK, so these guys, Nili Sedetlin, very clever group, in 01 published this really nice paper. So let me describe it. What they said is, well, basically what I just said. And then they said, well, we're not going to be able to get a 3D surface normal from a single image. So what do we do? What we do is we, we make the following observation. On the occluding contour of the sphere, right around here, the z component of the surface normal is 0 well, in the proper coordinate system. So assume that this is the z coordinate of my world coordinate system. Well, then this point here at the occluding boundary has a 0 for that term. Great. OK, so let's look at our equation. Well, what happens is if this is 0 here, this doesn't matter. It doesn't contribute anymore. So what I've now reduced my equation to is something that is still linear in my unknowns, now 3. And I can estimate nx and ny. I can estimate the x and the y component of this because it's just, right, I've got the occluding boundary. I fit a little patch there, and I take the orthogonal thing. So I can estimate 2D surface normals. That's easy. So the good news now is it's linear. I can estimate these two things in an actual image. The bad news is I lost something. I lost one degree of freedom. So what we're going to be able to do with this technique is tell you that the light is here, but I won't be able to tell you along which arc in this direction. Right? There's, an, there's a degree of ambiguity. Okay? So we can do this, but we can't do this. And the second technique I'll tell you is how do you get this? How do you get the z component? Right? So let's start with these two, and then we'll worry about the third component later. All right, Nilius and Eklund, we, have, we didn't do this. This isn't our work. This is still Nilius and Eklund. So how do you do this? Well, it's linear. This is not hard. So here's your unknown, two components of the light direction and the ambient term. Here's your surface normal. So we're going to do this times this is that. So that's the equation I had in the previous slide. All right, well, I can estimate those surface normals at a whole bunch of places around my object, right? And as long as I come up with three linearly independent versions of these, I can solve this. Right? So what you do is you walk around your occluding boundary, you grab a bunch of surface normals, you grab the corresponding intensity, you set up a system of linear equations, quadratic error function, differentiate set equal to 0, solve, and you've got your classic least squares estimation. Okay, so all you got to do is invert this matrix, and you're done. Right? Close form analytic solution, fast, simple, and remarkably effective. Yes? That's a good question. You don't even have to finish it, and it's a good question. How reliable is the intensity measurement at the occluding boundary? Right. So there's some, I, it's, it's a cheat. I put it under the rug. So something is weird here. I don't actually know the intensity at the occluding boundary, do I? Because it's, it's actually on top. I don't see it. OK, so here's what we've discovered. It turns, out you, ooh, it turns out you can just grab the intensity right here, just along the inside boundary, and it actually seems to be work fine. And what's amazing is, if you look at it, you can sort of see why. right? I mean, imagine this image grabbing just this inside. It's black here, white here. Where is it brightest? That's the direction to the light source. And that's actually why it works. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually add some regularization to stabilize this estimation. I'll show you that in a second. But it's surprisingly stable. Um, I suppose it depends on your skin. Um, if it's shiny skin, we have trouble. So we often, we, we did a forgery, we, we did an examination of somebody recently, and it was a basketball player who was really sweaty. Um, and actually, we had a lot of trouble with it. Um, but we've also done a lot of um, um, forensic exams of people's faces, and it actually works just fine. Um, we don't have trouble with it. Did you have a question? Otherwise, the normal at the edge could be anything at all. Uh, yes. So we are going to assume well, it doesn't have to be closed. Um, and what, all we need, actually need is that locally it's, it's actually continuous so that we can actually differentiate it and get the surface normal out. Well, it doesn't close. It counts here, but I can stretch it out until it's an axe blade. You know, it, the, the normal has nothing to do with the shape of three dimensions. I, I didn't get that last part. Well, the, the 
the last part was, was uh, incoherent, but what I'm saying <laughs> well, that's why, then. <laughs> is that if, if you have an unclosed surface, then you can uh, make any normal at Oh, because of the occluding contour will be, uh, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're right. That's right. We ha and maybe I should say, maybe we want to assume like some kind of convexity to sort of make it clean or something like that, right? But for example, for a typical, like a person standing here, right, I can take the occluding contour of the arms, the legs, the torso, I mean, the face, anything like that, right? All of those things work just fine, right? As long as I can get 2D surface normals off of, the, off of this occlusion, it's fine. Negative result on the other side. Damn okay. it. Uh, yes, there is. There's actually a nonlinearity in there. So the problem is this is a cosine and it can go negative. And there actually is a nonlinearity there. And we have a cheat to fix that so we don't have to worry about it. And I can show you the paper for how we do it. It's actually not hard. Basically, if you think about only the hemisphere that's facing towards the light, then you've got a linearity. If you just essentially ignore this part. And you don't have to worry about it. But yes, there is a nonlinearity in there. Yes? Ah. Wait, are you saying that you'll have higher error when the, say it again, when the direction? Because if the light vector, yeah. Closer, yeah. Uh, to the, to the camera. What, what you mean? You mean the actual light is not infinitely far away? It's actually close no, now. Let's talk about the direction of the light. Okay. Okay. So if it's derivative, if the direction is such that the derivative of the closing number is maximum, then your estimation using the pixels of the interior of the boundary is that being more sensitive to errors, right? No, I don't think so, and here's why. I think you're thinking about derivative in the wrong space. We're not taking luminance derivatives. We're taking, we're taking derivatives of the shape here. So if I want the surface normal, right, what I do is I take an x and y derivative at this point. In fact, I don't, we don't even really take derivatives. What we do is we fit. No, we the thing is that your, your frame estimate sounding is changing very rapidly at the locations where your frame estimate. <laughs> so you're, you're worried about our ability to estimate surface normals at this point. Is that what your concern is? No. Uh, L, yeah. such that your measurements are very sensitive to its direction. All right, I don't actually think that's the case, but, but let's talk about it afterwards, because I may be misunderstanding you. OK, so system of linear equations you can solve in analytic form, and you're done. And that basically was Nilly Snackman's paper. And it is surprisingly effective, even when you don't have an infinite light source. Even when it's not a point light source, and even when you don't have Lambertian and constant reflectance, it actually works surprisingly well. Not great, but good. So here's a couple things we did to try to help it along. And this is now where our work came in. So one thing that was bugging us was this constant reflectance over the entire surface. Because that's a really strong constraint, right? The entire surface that you're interested in has to have exactly the same color. And we wanted to replace it with a local assumption of reflectance. That is, locally, over a little patch, the, the color doesn't change, but it may change as you move along the contour. So what we're going to do, in, 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 the, in the original version, here's what you had. You've got surface normals along your occluding contour. You've got a single directional light source. And you just do a single estimate. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the reflectance over this little green area here is constant, still Lambertian. And, but it could be different than this little patch right here. And notice that my light direction vectors now are both pointing in the same direction, because the light source is infinitely far away, but their magnitudes are a little bit different. This one's a little bit shorter than this one. Well, why is that? Well, remember that the reflectance term folds into the magnitude of the light source. So it's possible that even if the light is in the same direction, these guys will change magnitudes, because they're essentially embodying the difference in reflectance. So how do you set this up? Well, it actually is surprisingly easy. You've now got a series of individual light source estimates for each little patch. Each one has a block matrix here with the surface normals over that patch. And you have the intensities at those things. So you can just set up a bigger system of linear equations and solve it, and fine. But this is not a good idea. And the reason is, let me back up one slide, is that we are essentially treating this estimate and this estimate as completely independent. Right? I mean, if you go to this slide, we're estimating each component of the light source, assuming that they have nothing to do with each other. And of course they have something to do with each other. They're all pointing in the same direction. 
So we should, we, should, we should actually condition it so that these things roughly have the same direction. And in fact, if you just use this, you get actually very unstable results. And the reason is that these block matrices are almost each rank deficient because you're only over this little patch where the surface normals don't change very much. So here's what we do. Here's our least squares estimator from the previous slide. And we add a regularization, a smoothness, whatever term you like to call. And what it is is it says we're going to penalize the difference between the neighboring light source directions. OK, so li, li plus, uh, minus 1, li minus 2, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is some parameter that we can adjust. And the good news is this stays linear. So we can write this part here as this matrix times the unknown. And the whole thing still has a least square solution, where that's a pseudo inverse. So it still has a clean analytic solution. And um, we can actually relax the global assumption for the local assumption of constant reflections. And this helps a lot in a forensic setting. And the other thing we've done, which I won't describe, is we've made this work for a local light source. So not just uh, the sun, but actually if you're in a room and there's a spotlight, we've actually, actually been able to make this work for local light sources. A little tricky, but it actually seems to work OK. So let me just show you how effective this is. Um, so we wanted to test this outdoors, because that's basically where we have the best approximation to the infinite light source, single light source. And I had this really cool idea of using a GPS-enabled camera and you know, all this sort of triangulation to figure out where the sun was at any given moment, give relative to your position. And I told this to my student, Kimo Johnson. And um, he looked at me like I was nuts. And he, came, he literally left my office, came back like 20 minutes later. And in his hand, he was holding a piece of cardboard and a stick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> if it's possible, you can be embarrassed and proud at the same time. <laughs> And so what we did is we put a sundial in the world, and the shadow cast by the stick on the piece of cardboard tells us where the sun is. It's really smart, isn't it? I was pretty impressed. <laughs> um, so we've got you know, reasonable calibration as to where the sun is, I mean, within maybe a degree or two. So here are the surfaces. We manually select them. Um, and this is where your nonlinearity comes in. What we do is you have to know roughly where the, where the light is within a hemisphere. And you pick surfaces that are basically roughly in that direction. We've actually been able to relax that. We have a paper we just submitted that actually removes all of these assumptions that you have to make and actually deals with it in a, in a much more elegant way than this, this hack. But this is how we do it. This is how we did it originally. Um, these white ones are the individual estimates. And then the blue, after the regularization, the whole minimization, and the blue is simply the vector average of all of those. And this is one of the best situations. You've got these you know, Lambertian pipes with you know, lots of surface normals, a beautiful example. It's about two degrees error. Here's another example. Uh, this is about the average. Uh, about 8 degrees. So this is typically what we find is av averages between 8 and 12 degrees are roughly what we can estimate um, the light source direction. Remember, by the way, we only get two components of the light source. right? We only Literally, this is the estimate right here. It's in plane. We don't know anything about the z yet. Okay. And this is the worst case scenario. Um, it's these parking meters that are slightly specular. Um, and we grabbed a bunch of surface that is actually almost orthogonal to the light source. So you get slight instabilities there because of the direction. Um, because of that nonlinearity. And so the, here are the error. This is one of the worst cases, is about you know, 12 or 13 degrees. OK. So here's an example where we actually use that in real image. We don't, I mean, we know this is the forgery, but we don't know where the lights were. Um, but here we used um, her arm, her back here. And for him, we used his, sh his back and his arm and for the surface normals. And we get a difference of about 40 degrees. And we actually played with different parts of the image. And pretty consistently, um, within 10 degrees or so, we get these two measurements. So when the light is wrong by 40 degrees or so, you know, it, even though when it's visually not very obvious. And by the way, this was a really cruddy JPEG image. So this is actually works on, on pretty cruddy images. And, and I think the reason, by the way, is that you're, only, you're looking for the bright spot, basically. I mean, that's essentially what it comes down to. It's just not that complicated. Just you know, the formulation is a little involved. But um, but it turns out actually not to be a hard estimate to make. All right. Okay, so how do we get that third component, the Z? Well, the problem is that you, you, where do you get 3D surface normals from? I mean, that's, that's essentially what the question is. And that turned out to be hard. So this is where this idea of using the specularities came in. So you'll remember this example. And now, so here is the idea. Um, the eye is lovely. It's basically a sphere, or it's actually a, a two spheres embedded in one another. And so the idea we had is that if we could, if we could, if we could see the image of the light in the eye, and we could localize it, 
And if we can get a 3D model of the eye, we would have 3D surface normals. And if we had 3D surface normals, we should be able to figure out where the light is in three space. Okay? So let's talk about how to do that. So here's the basic idea. Uh, here's an obviously simulated eye. There's a little white specularity right there. And here's the basic imaging geometry. You've got a camera. You've got a single light source. You've got a point on the eye. And you've got the surface normal at that point. This is all in three space. I'm showing you a, 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 a section, of course. And in a perfect reflective surface, the angle between the light and the surface normal, theta i, will be the same as the angle between the surface normal and the camera. Okay? And I, sorry, what I mean by that is that the angle at which you will see the specularity is at this orientation for a perfect reflective surface. And obviously, for a non-perfect, you got a little slop there. So what we know then is that there's a relationship between L, the direction to the light source, which is what we want, the surface normal, which we can hopefully estimate, uh, the view direction, which hopefully we can estimate. And that relationship was a little bit of algebra is basically what you see on the bottom. So you can see that if I know V, and I know n, it's trivial to solve for the direction of the light source. Inner product, inner product, a little bit of arithmetic, the whole thing is over. Okay? So the question is, how do you get n, the 3D surface normal, and how do you figure out the direction between what the eye is, what, essentially what direction the camera is looking at, the, the eye is looking at? Okay. So let's talk about the 3D surface normal first. Um, there's actually quite a bit of literature out there about modeling eyes. So here's a basic cross section cross-section of the eye that you see here. Turns out, this is not our construction. There are these nice references for how you, you can model this. Um, you can basically model an eye of an adult human with two embedded spheres. So again, so you have cross-section. These are actually spheres. Um, so here's one sphere in dark gray, one sphere in light gray. They are offset by a distance d. Uh, the big sphere has radius r1. The little sphere has radius r2. And so three degrees of freedom for your model. Turns out human adults with normal eyes, basically within a very small error, can be modeled with these coefficients. Women are about 1% smaller than men in terms of the, 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 these, these uh, dimensions here. Very small difference. Yes? Oh, god damn it. Yeah, that's hard. Um, <laughs> You know what? I, when, so when somebody asked me this, I said, we hadn't done the experiment. I thought, ah, it's not going to matter because the contact is right up against it. It's a disaster. It really matters. But it's not, it's, what really matters is the position of the specularity. It actually changes it. So it doesn't actually change so much. We don't know how much it changes the geometry, but it moves that position of that little guy. And glasses do it even worse. So it actually is a problem if you have contacts and lens and glasses, and, and I don't have, I, and we don't know, right? Glasses is easy, right? Like, oh, don't, don't, I, don't use it for glasses. Um, we don't, we're actually doing the experiments with contacts now to see what the sensitivity is. Um, so, but it, it does have an impact. It's a great question. All right, are you done? Or because I'm, you know, <laughs> all right. <laughs> oh, man. I just gave this talk at Foveon. They weren't as smart as you guys, so you'll be happy to hear. Ooh, shit, sorry. <laughs> Give me that, that, that consent form back. <laughs> All right, I'm going I'm to stay, stay on script. All right, so what's hard about this? Well, here's what, one of the things that's hard. Is, so you have an idea you can get 3D surface normals. If you can model this with two spheres, um, of course, then you can get 3D surface normals. That's not hard. But here's the thing that's going to be a little tricky. The 3D surface normals are with respect to the eye, right? So that's in the world coordinate system. And I haven't told you how we're going to do it, but if we get a view direction, it's actually going to be with respect to the camera coordinate system. And of course, that doesn't work, right? So now you've got these vectors in completely different coordinate systems, and, you're, and you want to, of course, combine them. And so now you've got another problem, which is not only do you have to estimate this, and you have to estimate this, which I haven't shown you how to do yet, you then have to relate them in the same coordinate system. So that's a whole other problem. OK. So Kimo Johnson, who did all of this work, um, is really deserves the credit for this, because he basically figured out how to do this. And it, was, it turned out to be a really hard problem. And you can dig up the paper on our web page. We just published it. Um, but here's basically how it works. I'm not going to go through the details of it, because it's, you know, it would take about two hours or so. So you've got a coordinate system in the world, and you've got a coordinate system in the image, and you want to relate the two. So it's a classic camera calibration problem. And you can write that as the following. It's this matrix H, which is a product of an intrinsic matrix, which has things like focal length, 
scale factors and all that, and an extrinsic, which relates the rigid body transformation between the two coordinate systems. Okay, so that's what we want to estimate. And here's just to give you a top level view of how this is going to work, how we do it. We know that the limbus here should be just about a perfect circle. So imagine somebody is sort of looking in this direction and the camera is over there. What's going to happen is that that limbus is going to be imaged as an ellipse. And the deviation of that ellipse from a circle is basically tells you where is that camera um, or the view direction. That's the, basically the idea. So what we do is we set up, unfortunately, nonlinear minimization. That's this right here, which says, here's the, the points on the, limb, on the image limbus. That's little xi. We know that if you apply some transformation matrix H to a perfect circle in the world coordinate system, you should get to that. Tell me what that is. And that turns out to be a nonlinear minimization. Yes? Um, you want me to go back to the model, don't you? Yeah. It's a 3D relief, and you're just talking about the circle where the spheres intersect. Yeah, so there's, there, OK, so, yeah. So it turns out that what I said on this slide is a bit of a lie. You actually have to deal with the fact that there's a 3D there. And that actually is in the paper, but it just it turns out to be really hairy to explain, which is why I sort of brush it under the rug. But yes, you have to actually worry about that, and we actually deal with it. OK, I know that's a bit of a cop out, but. Um, so this turns out to be a nonlinear minimization. Um, this is actually, but it turns out to converge very quickly because we can compute derivatives and we can do a conjugate gradient descent. And it's actually pretty efficient. So this is actually four iterations of the minimization and very quickly converges and seems to be very, very stable. Actually, we've not had problems with this, although I thought we would. Okay, so that means we can get the view direction, the calibration and the 3D surface normals. And of course, I haven't given you all the details, but you know, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of, of, of issues in the details of that. But you, know, you can look at the paper for that. This is our little uh, slightly creepy uh, uh, simulated world. Uh, we have a camera with one light source that's always affixed to the camera and another light source that moves between these four positions. We have eyes in one of four spatial locations against the wall and in one of three locations in Z. So we can actually play with where the eyes are. Of course, we have perfect knowledge of everything in this, in this little simulated world. And let me just give you an idea of how accurate this is in simulation. So here's a couple of examples of the eyes we took. Um, there's always two light sources, one directly on the camera and then one in one of these other positions. So um, we've annotated those specularities with little red dots. Um, the circle is both sort of semi-automatically, the, the ellipse rather, semi-automatically extracted from uh, the image. And the average error in estimating the direction to the light source is only, in 3D, by the way, is only three degrees. Um, and the max error is about seven degrees. And just for point of reference, the uh, radius of the, um, of the eye here is about 25 pixels. So you, the diameter is 50. So it's about you know, 50 by 50 pixels. So Reasonably small, not tiny, but reasonably small. Okay, so not not unrealistic. Okay, so this is in simulation. You're getting about three degrees, max error of about seven degrees, standard deviation about one. Now, in in real world, so this is a uh, chemo in our lab. He's sitting in various positions, looking in various directions. We had two light sources, uh, studio lighting on either side of him, and calibration was only so-so. We actually did just measuring tapes because we couldn't figure out how to get really accurate. So these measurements are probably off by a few degrees. But in the real images, we are off by about 9 degrees. Worst error was 16 degrees. And here, the radius of the eyes were only 9 pixels, so 18 by 18 right, pixels. These are tiny in the image. And we did this intentionally because in a forensic setting, you've got to worry about what happens when you've only got you know, 20 by 20 pixels that you're examining. So this is a pretty realistic setting. I think he actually went too small. I think he could have done better. But um, these errors, most of the increase in the error is due to this resolution, basically. Nevertheless, we can actually pretty reliably modular a couple of caveats, right? Contact lenses, glasses, things like that. But to the extent that you can localize a light source, you can estimate its 3D location um, pretty accurately. Yes? Yeah, we're, we're working on that. Um, we actually have been thinking about because can you exploit the symmetries in the face basically to figure out um, where that person is. He was asking about can you figure out the view direction from his, um, his face. So for example, if you look at him, you can get an idea of where the camera is. We, the, the thing is we don't think you're going to be able to do it very accurately. 
because we think this, the symmetries are not actually going to be very reliable. But actually, we're working on we're actually working on another idea that, in addition to getting a 3D model for the eyes, getting 3D models for faces. Um, faces are actually not that different, and we've actually there's a really nice database of 3D laser scanners of people's faces, and we're trying to find places on people's faces that are largely consistent, things like the forehead, the cheeks, you know, things like this, and be able to extract surface normals from that and 3D surface normals, and then do measurements from that. Because obviously, this is a very specialized technique, right? It's when you can see the specularity in the eye. Okay, so we'd like to be able to do that in, in other settings, and we're working on that right now. The other thing we, we, we've done, we've just submitted a paper on this, is taking the original idea that I showed you with the light source direction and generalizing it to complex lighting environments. So in an environment like this, if I ask you, what is the direction to the light source, it's, it's sort of a silly question, right? There is no light source, and yet I am being illuminated. So it's obviously a far more complicated lighting environment than light source and ambient term. So what do you do with those environments? And we actually have a paper we just submitted on um, essentially estimating uh, environment maps. This actually comes from uh, computer graphics technology. So the idea is that imagine you take a, uh, a sphere, Lambertian sphere, and you put it in the middle of the room, and you essentially ask, well, what does that sphere look like? You know, what's the color of it? What's the shading on it? And how do you estimate the parameters of that? And what we do is we use spherical harmonics to estimate the, the lighting environment for complex lighting. So now we can do lighting forensics in a far more general setting. We don't have to rely on a single light source um, being present. Um, oh, yeah, and these are the results for the American Idol. Uh, so we estimated the direction to the light source. It came out exactly as you expected. This is actually a hemisphere for each of the eyes. These are little probability um, um, uh, distributions on the sphere showing where the light source is most likely. So you see these two are basically the same, and actually these two are quite different. This guy was actually probably taken with a flash. You notice that it's almost direct on um, facing the camera. Um, and these were obviously taken with studio lighting up and, and off to the sides. Okay. So... Um, how are we doing on time? Five minutes. Five minutes, great. OK. So I started off by trying to sort of sketch out the scope of the issue of tampering. It's happening everywhere more and more and more. I mean, it's pretty much now on a daily basis I get an email from somebody somewhere worrying about some kind of forensics. And it's, it's utterly fascinating, in my opinion. I've been really sort of been, it's been an interesting few years. And we've been thinking a lot about forensics. I've talked mostly about images. Um, and our techniques fall into several categories, statistical, geometric, optical. And again, I think you need to have a suite of tools. No single technique is going to solve all your problems. Um, we're, we're just getting started with audio forensics. I have a new student, Wei Hong Wang, who's doing video forensics. And we're just getting into document uh, forensics, uh, scan documents, which of course have very different type of statistical properties and images. And of course, the question is one of countermeasures. And yes, every technique we described has a countermeasure. And those countermeasures have countermeasures. And so this is, so, you know, you think about it as spam and anti-spam and virus and antivirus. This is an arms race. We continue to do this. And in the end, what will happen is we'll make it harder to make forgeries. It will always be possible to create a forgery. I don't have any illusion about that. But I do think we will start to raise the bar and make it more difficult. And there are papers and source code for a lot of the things uh, on the web page, if you'd like. And we can take a few questions if anybody has any. Thanks. Uh, repeat the question for the video. OK. Uh, my question is, suppose you, you have a, large, a lot of images and you want to protect yourself from having those images being forged. What, what technique would you recommend? Like, could you use a special gamma curve or, you know, kind of a very transparent uh, watermark? Yeah. Well, so the obvious, I mean, so, you know, people like, what is it, Getty, you know, use the, the visible watermark. Um, but let's say you don't want to actually have anything visible. Right. So, so one approach would be watermarking. Right? So that's, that's sort of the obvious approach. I think the problem with the watermarking technology is that all evidence suggests that there are no secure watermarks. You can always rip the watermark out, and that doesn't seem surprising. There's actually some very nice work by Jessica Friedrich at SUNY Binghamton who has shown or has begun to show that images taken from the same camera have very specific noise patterns that seem to be unique to that camera. And I don't mean to make and model, I mean like the serial number of that camera. And that's not surprising, because CCDs and CMOSs are actually pretty variable. And so in some ways, uh, her work suggests that images from the same camera already have a watermark, and it's in the noise pattern. And she's done some really nice work with ballistics and forensics using underlying noise patterns. So there, you don't have to add anything, right? You can just 
um, do that. Um, you said something about adding a nonlinearity or a gamma. We actually have some work in, in, in showing that when you introduce gamma or a pointwise luminance nonlinearities, you actually introduce some really interesting ar artifacts in the Fourier space. And so that is a possibility, and we can talk about it afterwards if you like. Um, but I mean, the, the obvious way to protect images is, is typically the, the invisible, robust watermark. It, it doesn't make it impossible, but it makes it difficult. And then they're actually pretty easy to search for. That's the benefit. Methods that you just mentioned uh, sufficiently refined to permit uh, recovery of actual response curves from uh, images? Um, no. They're, very, they're, they're, they're actually very um, crude. Um, we model the nonlinearities with, with a simple gamma, a one parameter gamma or a two parameter sigmoid, and the errors are, are far too high to do calibration. They're good for forensics, but they're not good for actual you know, high quality um, um, calibration, no. How much of your spine? Ah, how much are juries buying it? That's a great question. Um, so I, I don't know. I've worked a couple dozen cases probably in the last few years, and I've only lost one. Um, they're buying it. Um, I mean, they're buying both sides of the argument. They're buying that you can tamper with things, but they're also buying the fact that you know, one side of the aisle is always exaggerating the technology. And you know, people are doing things like saying, well, here are these images, and they're computer generated. And there's no way in hell they're computer generated. right? We know that there are limits to CG technology, for example. We know that there are limits to Photoshop. So Photoshop can't take a picture of somebody in profile and generate an image like this. right? Now, juries don't know this, but if you explain to them why you can't go from this to this, they're like, oh, well, OK, fine. right? So they are buying it, and the courts are buying it. Um, I think they should be suspicious, and they should be slow to buy it, though. I mean, anytime technology enters a court of law, we should be very, very careful, because the stakes are very, very high. Um, but I think there is going to be room for it, and it seems to be happening. So you know, when cameras take pictures, JPEGs, they sharpen images and stuff like that. Yeah. And sharpening must play in your shading algorithms. Let's yeah. Um, so this is becoming an increasing concern to us. Uh, oh, sorry, repeat the question. So you were asking about um, when cameras take a picture, they do onboard processing, sharpening, denoising, all uh, white balance correction, all kinds of things. And we are seeing more and more cameras doing a lot of work at the sensor level or on chip level. And so what we are getting is something that is already heavily, heavily processed. Um, for the lighting stuff, the nonlinearities, we've actually done the sensitivity, don't seem to matter. So put some gamma, sigmoid, sharpening, noise, doesn't seem to bother us. Other techniques, it's actually a problem. Um, so, but what we're also seeing is that cameras are starting to do even more sophisticated processing. So the Canon has a camera now that will take an image of a person and do what's called the Photoshop diet, which it will thin that it will it will resize in this dimension to make the person look thinner. This is I, I, it's just it's amazing. Um, so this is happening on, on on board, right? Not even in Photoshop. And so so what's coming out of the camera already has been manipulated, and that is going to make our life very very difficult. Um, so the hope there is that, well, okay, so this thinning will, will hurt statistical techniques, but probably the lighting stuff will still work more or less. Maybe surface normals will be disrupted a little bit. But, you know, so that's the hope of that. You just you sort of build up enough techniques. And so we have, you know, we have software now, and we have maybe a dozen techniques. And any given image, I can maybe run four or five of them, and the other ones just simply don't apply. And that's, you know, as you build more techniques, you just have more tools in your, in your toolkit. Which images are easier to do forensics? Uh, the JPEGs of cameras or raw pictures converted to JPEG? Um, all right, so the question is, what's easier? Uh, straight JPEG out of the camera or raw to JPEG? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, my guess is that, um, so the thing that we, let me answer, I, since I don't know the answer to that, let me answer another question. <laughs> the thing we have the most difficulty with are low resolution images. Um, something that's been JPEG compressed below 50% and has been rescaled down to 200 by 200, I mean, you know, we're, we're done for, right? There's just nothing there. Um, so I don't, I suspect there probably won't be a difference between captured and raw and saved to JPEG and JPEG directly in. I, I don't think there'll be a big difference. Yeah. Well, if somebody's camera, like, you know, maybe not Photoshop specifically, but if somebody's doing, you know, a camera capture and draw, they have to use something to make it change that. Won't you always expect some photographic software to have its interpolation in there? Um, so, so the interpolation I was talking about was this, the color filter array interpolation. So there, 
um, the JPEG is sort of independent of that, right? Because what happens is you go from uh, raw, a CFA, you create RGB, and then you JPEG compress. And the hope, by the way, is that the JPEG compression doesn't destroy the CFA artifacts, right, the interpolation. So, so that technique is very, very good when you have high quality JPEG or TIFF or RAW images, but sort of starts to suffer very quickly when you add a lot of JPEG. And I don't actually think that answered your question, but I, I didn't really understand the question fully. Okay, good. 80%. Can't, can't argue that. Okay, uh, one more then. So you had a comment before about people saving in JPEG. What's the alternative? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Well, I think JPEG 2000 is a little bit better. I think the wavelet compression is better than the DCT. I think what really makes JPEG nasty, nasty is that block DCT transform. And I think the, the JPEG 2000 with the wavelet transform is actually better. It's got different artifacts, but they're better. My preference is uncompressed TIFF. <laughs> I know it's not very realistic. <laughs> um, I only shoot in RAW, to be honest. I, I don't shoot in JPEG. I shoot in RAW. But I, I actually think JPEG 2000 is better. And I'm actually amazed that it still doesn't seem to have caught on, as far as I can tell. It's, it's just not. And it's been around for, it's 2000, right, JPEG 2000. So you know, seven years later, it, it doesn't seem to be really catching on. I, I think that would actually be an improvement. OK, thanks.